So, glad to have you all here. This is um, GP5 Empowerment Columbus. And uh, we're getting ready to take it off and lead oh. worship. And oh. Derek, Derek did an amazing job this morning. And he's going to lead this afternoon and even tonight. So if, um, if you break away for a little bit, come back at 7. So let's take it away, Derek. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place today. Father, I surrender my mind, my body, my soul, my mouth, my hands, my tongue, my everything to you, Father. God, I ask that you let your presence raise sovereign in this place as we enthrone you as king today. As we worship you and praise you, Father, in truth and spirit, let your Holy Spirit resonate in this place. Walk the aisles, I pray, Holy Spirit, looking for those who are hungry and ready to receive and pour out blessings upon us as we bless your name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch I read. I once was lost, but now I found was blind. Father, your goodness ran after me. Your mercy and your grace chased me down. <laughs> you're so wonderful, Father. You're so awesome. You're so good, Lord. I don't deserve your goodness, Father, but because of who you are in me, because of who I am in you, I can live in you, Jesus. And your goodness not only chases me, <laughs> but it carries in me and it comes with me everywhere I go. Your goodness goes. <laughs> Father, you're 
you're so awesome. Father, you're so wonderful. Mm. <laughs> I worship you, Father. <laughs>
You're so awesome in this place. <laughs> you reign sovereign as you are enthroned as king. You are enthroned as king, Father. Above all others, above all others, above all others, you are enthroned as king. Yeah. sharing a dream that I had a while back. A couple years ago, I was in a play at my church in Phoenix City, Alabama. It was an Easter resurrection service. And I played a thief on the cross. And while I was up there on the cross, God began to deal with my heart. I was in sin. And a lot of it. But I was coming to church and I was doing my church thing. And I was loving on the Lord as best I could, as best I knew how. He began to deal with my heart. So I went home after church, after the service, and I went to my grandmother's house and pulled out my Bible. God, you're so good. <laughs> As I was reading, I fell asleep. <laughs> and God gave me the most awesomest dream in the whole world. See, I've been struggling with sexual immorality and I had some unpure relationships in my life and I was stuck and I couldn't get out. I loved God with us all the heart that I had, but I could not get out of that mess I was in. And as I was reading my scriptures and I was meditating on his word and I was trying to write a song at the time, I fell asleep and I dreamed that I was on a cross. <laughs> you see that cross right there? I'm so glad it's there. It's got a sign on top. And on that cross that I was hanging on was a sign that says sexual immorality. And this is a two-part dream. But at the beginning of this dream, I was on this cross. And I was hanging and it had sexual immorality. And in front of this cross was an altar. And on this altar were idols. There were all kinds of idols within the church, within our lives, within our home, within our nation, within this world. And the church was in front of me mourning. The whole Christian body of Christ was in front of me mourning. And they were crying and sad. And I was on that cross and I felt so alone. I was hanging blood dripping down from my hands. And the shame all over me. And guilt was all over me. And I laid there on that cross. And I cried out to God, save us, save us all. I woke up. Right when I said that, I woke up. And I began to worship the Lord. And I tried to write a song. And all of a sudden, he put me back to sleep. I almost fell over in the creek. <laughs> He put me back to sleep and a part two of this dream came to me and I was on the cross. 
But the sign was a little different. You see, the sign says sexual morality just like before, but the sign was cracked all the way in half. It gets even better. <laughs> Instead of the church being in front of me, the church was behind me, praising and worshiping and supporting me in this ministry. They were supporting the call of God in my life instead of condemning me and knocking me down. And on the, on the altar were all the idols that I had seen before in the first part of the dream. Every single idol was completely destroyed and broken and rendered non-valuable. And I woke up from that dream and I said, God, what on earth does this mean? And I wouldn't know until a year ago. This dream was over 10 years ago, and just recently I received a word from the Lord that was prophesied over me and my wife that we had a special calling and a special mission in our lives. And the calling and mission is to come to churches and renew and restore the relationship between church and the sinner. See, I was raised in church. My dad was a preacher, so I kind of grew up a little bit religious, and I didn't understand these things as an adult like I do now. I had to go through a lot of mess, and God allowed me to make choices and decisions. That brought me down to almost nothing. But I'm so glad he did in his grace and his mercy. He brought me back up. And he's reteaching me and relearning me line by line, precept by precept. And the word of the Lord is more clear. And, and I'm so hungry for it now. And I receive such more and I see much more clear. But the point I want to make is, is today. God restores and he redeems. I was 20, 20-ish. 20 in my early 20s and I laid on my deathbed. I had not eaten or drank for 16 days. My grandmother fed me through a straw, fed me Gatorade. And she knew I was dying, but I didn't and I was in denial. The truth was I was HIV positive and didn't know it. I had been that way for three to five years and didn't know it. When I found out they had told me I had already had it between three and five years, I was at the breaking point of full-blown AIDS. I had less than nine T-cells. They could count nine T-cells. Should have been at least 8,000. That was the beginning point for me, a beginning point of transition where God began to work. Now the gifts and call come without repentance. So I had all these gifts growing up. As I was struggling in my own sin, say I want to make a point here. A lot of us are struggling and we won't allow ourselves to be used by the Lord because we judge ourselves. We condemn ourselves and that's not what God is. That's not what Jesus died for and that's not what he gave us these gifts for. You can get up and encourage anybody. When God moves upon you, you have a word uttered on your lips. Let it out. Don't be ashamed of where you've been or what you've done. Because when you call upon Jesus, his grace is sufficient. Where there is great sin, there is great grace. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, it took me a long time to learn that. But I just want to say, God is calling this church and many others to a point of restoration. There are many people who are hurt in the church. You know, the enemy will take hurt and go a long way with it, make a lot of stories and make things a lot worse. But when you put God in it, when God shines his light and he brings healing and wholeness to your life and to your church and to your body, great things will start to happen. I just want to say what God has done for me. He brought me out of the lifestyle of homosexuality and of sexual immorality. And he gave me gifts of music and he gave me other gifts. And I began to try to work and try to move in those and developed my relationship with Christ and I struggled and struggled. For many years I just wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't sing and I, I wouldn't cry out and there was a time where I went through a deep depression and I was saying, God, I, I need to get out of this relationship. I mean, I'm stuck. You know, I was so devoted and so and so chasing after the Lord that my, my, my partner would leave the house because I'd turn on the TV and I'd start praying. And I'd walk around that room with my Bible and I'd speak in my heavenly language. And they told me, you have a false tongue because of the, how you live. And I said, no, I don't. I said, I know who is within me and the greater is he that is within me than he who is in this world. They told me, you cannot pray like that. How can you speak in tongues and yet you're going home living with another man? Yeah. I said, but you don't know where I was and you don't know where God was in me. God looked past my sin. He looked past my fault. He said, Derek, I'm running after you. And little did I know he was coming that quick. But he gave me strength one day to get my Bible and take two shirts and a pair of pants and walk away from my house that I worked so very hard for. I worked 18 years for that piece of property, and I worked a long time, very hard for my house. But God honored a request. I said, God, I want this house because I was, I was supposed to die. I wasn't supposed to see 30 years old. I was 25 years old when my dad passed. And I was suffering again and about to be football maids another time because of my sin and because of my lifestyle and the way the things that I've done, I've gotten sick again. 
And let me tell you how good he is and how merciful he is. Yeah. And when I took my Bible and walked down the hill, I said, God, I'm leaving this. I'm leaving him and I'm leaving everything. And I don't know where I'm going. But by the time I got down to my driveway, my parents had pulled up. My mama pulled up and said, Derek, what's wrong? I was hiding in the grass. Fear had already struck me. Fear had already hit me that by the time I got to the driveway to where I could get out of there, that my, my former lover would come back and we would be fighting. He ransacked the house and tore it up in anger that I had left. So I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where I was going to be living. I said, God, I'm, this is fresh for me. And I'm scared and I'm nervous. But a pastor called me up and said, come to my house. And I stayed there for two weeks. And for two weeks, they prayed for me. And I struggled and I struggled. And I said, how's this going to work, God? How's it going to work? Finally, he began to deal with me. He began to change things in my heart. He began to minister to me in my life. And he began to show me things. He said, this is where I want to take you. But you have to be willing to walk. You have to be willing to put one foot in front of the other. <laughs> That's not always easy. But when you get desperate enough, when you get hungry enough, and when you get that desire that you want nothing but God, it doesn't become that hard anymore. Because I didn't have a problem walking down that street. I was facing fear. Yes, I did. But I didn't have a problem leaving where I was. Because I knew where I was going to be. Amen. God promised me hell. God promised me give me my land back if I repented and saw his face. And I started to repent. I started to change my ways of thinking. And God began to break that lifestyle off of me. I could not do it on my own. Yeah, I tried. I, I packed my bags and I left three times. And it took three times. And God said, that's enough. I'll take care of you. I will deliver you. Sometimes we have to get on our face before God and cry out. I cried out personally for three months. For three months I cried out to the God, nose to the dirt, breathing so hard the dirt would get into my eyes, and I didn't care because I wanted my Father's love. I wanted redemption. I wanted to be brought back to where I once was, to my first love, who's Jesus. Because when I was two years old, I remember to this day singing, Every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. But that joy and that stamina was no longer in my heart. God had to restore that. I say I grew up in a church that didn't preach, always didn't preach relationship. And but God's grace is so awesome. He really began to work in my heart and unlearn some things in my mind and I got introduced to a church uh, called Grace of Fort St. Georgia, Grace Community. And there's where I began to receive my deliverance. The first time ever a church, a pastor, showed me love that was so real and so anointed that it broke chains off me immediately. One touch from the Father through my Papa healed me instantly of the emotional trauma that I went through as of being abused as a child. I grew up in a family where there was incest. I grew up in a family where my cousins and blah, 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 and things were happening. And I, and I had such a distorted view of the presence of God. I had such a distorted view of Holy Spirit. I was confused and hurt. I didn't want to be in the Spirit all the time growing up because there was a time where my mother, she had a chemical imbalance. She said, I didn't know that. I was a young child. But there were times she'd get angry and snap, and she beat the literal mess out of me a few times. I was even in the shower, got beat with a broomstick while I was taking a shower, and while she was doing so, she was speaking in another language. And I said, I don't understand you, Holy Spirit. How can you beat me and love me at the same time? I really related to what J.D. said earlier this morning about being in an abusive situation and, and not understanding. Sometimes we grow up in circumstances and we learn things the wrong way, but God has truth. His word has truth. And he will send and speak to his sons and daughters to come to you and plant seed and plant life into your life and restoration. And I want to tell you today, not only am I healed of HIV AIDS, but I've been oh, set man. free Ooh. from sexual immorality. <laughs> I am where I'm supposed to be and I'm happy. I'm a total new man. And not only did God heal me and restore my life and health, but he brought my woman back. <laughs> See, we have a long history. <laughs> I wanted to get married to her a lot, a lot younger in my life, but I wasn't ready. I had struggles and I had things I wasn't ready to deal with. But like I said earlier, God sometimes will allow you to make mistakes and bring you to a point where you're almost nothing. And then he brings you up line by line, precept by precept. And I want to charge this church and the people here to start praying and start interceding. 
for your congregation and for this city because God is doing a work. I feel the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> God is doing a work in this town. Not only is he restoring churches and the people within the church that have been hurt, but he's restoring pastors and youth leaders and music ministers. There's a greater anointing that is not coming, but is already here. And all we have to do is step into it and walk into it by faith and be obedient and surrender to the Holy Spirit. There is a forgiveness coming to this body. There is a redemption coming to this body in the name of Jesus. He is going to bring people here to this church who are hungry, who are ready and are willing for change now. There are people out there tonight crying out for God, crying out for his love and his mercy, crying out in desperateness for life. They're on their deathbed. They're in their car thinking about suicide. You may be at home on the floor right now this very second and you're crying out to God. I'm here to tell you, young man, lift up your hands to your help. Lift up your hands to God. Look up to Him to where your help is coming from. Look not to your left and not to your right, but look ahead, says the Lord, for I am coming to rescue you. My goodness comes after you. My goodness chases after you. I will heal you and I will set you free and I will restore your life. And what you, the devil has taken away from you, I will replace more than you lost. Redemption is coming. If you'll just grab a hold of this word today and know that God is working in this church, that God is working in this community, that forgiveness is being given out like crazy. That even, even I feel the gift of repentance coming to this church, that as y'all are beginning to do services, that the spirit's going to flow so heavy. This atmosphere is going to be so thick with the presence of God, you cut it with a butter knife. People will be laid out. People will be thrown to the floor. They will be on their knees crying out to God in this house. In this house, he brings people who are hungry. In this house, he will pour out his spirit upon all of you who are thirsty. All of you who are seeking the face of God and his righteousness will be fed and your thirst will be made whole. I thank you, Father, for your love and your grace, Lord. I thank you for what you've done in our lives. God, thank you for setting me free, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me up in such a way, Lord, and showing me your love, Father. Thank you for my beautiful wife who gives me strength, who gives me courage, who gives me stability, Lord. A wife that I can hold my her hand, Lord, and she'll stand by me when I'm weak and tell me I'm strong. Father, she looks at the good side and calls forth the greatness in me, and I thank you for that, Father. I thank you for a loving wife who supports me, Lord. I thought I'd never have that, Lord. I thought I, no woman would never love me after what I've done and where I've been. Yes. But God is so gracious. <laughs> He's so wonderful. Yes. And he'll restore your life. Yes. Yes, he twice I've been on my deathbed and twice I was ready to go. In my mind, but God had a different plan. Maybe you know somebody who's struggling with that lifestyle. Maybe you know somebody who's struggling with sickness and they're about to die. And they once knew God and you want to see them come back. I'm here to tell you right now there's a grace. There is a grace in your life. If you'll just raise your hands and ask God for it right now at this very moment. Father God, I pray for grace right now. Father, you would bring the hungry in, Lord, those that are ready for change. Father, it doesn't matter, man, woman, trisexual, bisexual, it doesn't matter, Lord. Bring them in, Father God. Let us show them your love. I'm telling you, it was God's love that brought me back. It was God's love that lifted me up and showed me who I really was and who I am to be. I'm no longer just a servant of God because a servant does not know his father's plans. But I am a son of the living God because I know my father and I know his plans. I thank you, Father, that you are spreading this throughout the congregation, that you are spreading this throughout this community, that people's lives are being changed. I speak life into this church. I speak life into this body. God, bless this house. Bless this house in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, bless the pastoral staff, Father, and bless the ones that work hard, Father, to make things happen around here. And I speak life. I speak life into this young man over here in the sound booth right now in the name of Jesus. Father, you've already blessed him, Lord. You've already encouraged him today. So, Father, I just increase that, and I ask for increase right now. Father, we activate the anointing, and we ask for increase in his life, Father, that not only will he be blessed in this church and be used in this church, Lord, that he will be used in his home, Father, that he will be used in the surrounding area and in the environment that he in, that he is becoming an atmosphere changer this day. Yeah. Father, I thank you for the grace upon his life, Lord. I thank you for the grace upon everyone in here, Lord, that you would just begin to lift us up, Father, and allow us to see, Lord, a taste of what you've got to come, Father, Lord. Comfort us, Father. Pour buckets of love yes. over us, dear God. And show us the way, Father. We are willing. We surrender, Lord. 
and we say, call us and we will go. So I thank you, Father, for the opportunity, Lord, to share a little taste of my testimony, Lord, and to share a little taste of the dream that you've given my wife and I. Lord, I just thank you for opportunities to go and speak to those that are hurting and those that are hungry, Lord. I thank you, Father, for your sweet, precious spirit that rests upon us. Yes. Father, go before us. Mighty hosts of heaven, go before us. Tear down strongholds right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this community. We stand strong and we stand in the gap for this community in Columbus, Georgia, right now in the Macon Road area. We call forth those that are hungry. Come, 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 come and drink from this well. For this well flows. This well flows mightily. And there is an increase coming to this church. There's an increase of love. There is an increase of power and authority because you have been faithful, because you have loved, and because you have broken the barrier, and because you have stepped into a new time and a new place where God is moving, and because you've acknowledged him, this anointing is being increased as we speak and as we pray. So we speak blessing upon this house. I encourage anyone that has, anyone that knows someone and you're calling for salvation for them, there's a special grace I feel right now today for salvation for lost loved ones. And I'll be the first one to start. I got a nephew. Blake, you're coming home. You're coming home because God loves you. You haven't done anything too bad. You haven't gone so far that God doesn't love you. And his goodness chases after you time and time again. Come forth. Come back to your first love. Let's see what God will do. Thank you, Father. In the sweet name of Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you. 